Convicts a black man of DUI even after body cam video shows a white police officer planting evidence. Leon County Judge Jason Jones sentenced Calvin Riley to 10 days in jail and six months of probation for the May 2023 arrest. This case received a national spotlight just days ahead of the start of the trial because a media outlet uh, uh, Our Tallahassee posted an edited clip of the arresting officer's body camera footage. The footage shows, in part, an officer picking up a bottle from Riley's car during the incident, pouring out the contents and placing the bottle back inside the vehicle. After the video garnered thousands of views and reaction last week, the Tallahassee Police Department denies any misconduct allegations. So I, I'm, I'm still sort of confused uh, by this here. I'm going to bring in my panel right now uh, to chat about this. Uh, glad to have them with us today uh, because uh, it, it is uh, it's still it's quite confusing. And, and when you start talking about uh, these type uh, of stories and this judge's decision, I'm still trying to understand that the alcohol was in the car and then now she empties the car and then places it back. Gavin Reynolds, contributor with The Root and former speechwriter for Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, also, uh, he joins us now from New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Tyler McMillan, social justice leader, former national director, youth and college of the National Action Network. Derek L. Jackson, Georgia State Representative, District uh, 68 out of Atlanta. You know what, I, I, I would say, uh, Derek, if I'm the police department, um, I'm putting that putting an officer on desk duty where they can get much better training because I, I still don't understand once she pulled him over suggesting that she smelled marijuana. I, I, I guess I'm still confused how you can smell marijuana with a moving car. Uh, but then all of a sudden it turns into a DUI and she pours the alcohol out. Uh, so I'm again, uh, this whole case has, um, has been confusing. You know, Roland, um, <clears throat> it is often uh, these types of scenarios that we constantly see, especially as it relates to black men, how uh, police officers uh, violate uh, their rights. I mean, when you go as far as planting evidence, so put training aside for a second. I think this is more about the behavior that we constantly see. This is a behavior where uh, those who think that it's OK to criminalize citizens before they are even charged, before, as you stated, how can you smell marijuana? Um, what what kind of sense do you have? That's the reason why we have uh, canines to do that kind of work. Uh, our sensitivity of our nose do not qualify a person to be able in the court of law saying, well, I smell marijuana. Um, I saw this uh, empty uh, bottle of, of liquor, and I suspect that this person should be charged. The judge, uh, which is even more confusing with this amount of evidence uh, from the body cam uh, video footage, clearly should make uh, the right call on this. But we tend to not see this because when it comes down to law enforcement, uh, and, and it's interesting that we continue to talk about immunity, uh, this immunity uh, that's typically garnered to law enforcement officers uh, tend to create this behavior, this mindset that we constantly see in these types of scenarios. It goes well beyond training, well before training, because if this uh, brother uh, was European or someone other than black, then the outcome uh, of this scenario would be very, very different. Um, and again, uh, I'm sure it's 10 days uh, given, but the reality is the actions of this officer should be questioned by folks all across the country. Absolutely. And, you know, ordinarily in situations like this where we have body cam footage, you know, we've seen the ways in which Thankfully, that footage sheds much needed light on the circumstances that actually transpired and actually end up making it such that, you know, the, the inevitable black man who's in the situation can get some sort of justice in that situation. But yet and still here we have this body cam footage and you know, this black man is still, you know, received this outcome you know, that he has. And we see this happen time and time again. 
just in the cases where we do have body cam footage and it does make the news, but how many other instances, you know, have we seen this occur? Have we not, not seen this occur when we don't have that body cam footage? We don't have that evidence. You know, in those cases, you know, justice is far from served for those police officers who carry out this malfeasance. Um, and we have to remember, too, that in so many instances, right, when black men in these situations like this gentleman here get, you know, this sort of stain on their on their criminal record, this can also have ramifications for their ability to ability to vote and participate in our democratic processes. So it's important that we keep that in mind. It's important. The last thing I'll say, too, is that, again, and I beat the drum on this time and time again, in this election season, we know there's a lot at stake at the presidential level, but there's so much at stake at the state and local levels, too. When we talk about who are the judges who are deciding these cases, who are the sheriffs and police chiefs who are going to be you know, leading these police departments? Who are the mayors, right, who we're voting for, who are going to appoint you know, those local law enforcement leaders? We have to understand that when we talk about our democracy, our democracy requires participation from each and every one of us at every single level. And that can be the difference between you know, these situations happening or not, or when they happen, ensuring that these police officers get desk duty and not another ride around the block. Tyler? Yeah, I, I will echo the, the same words as uh, my panelists before. I want not go into deeper, but I, I think, you know, my role as youth director, I had opportunity to work with a lot of families and victims that, that failed to police violence. And I think, you know, this is just a, you know, I, I think would think that he came out safe, but I think this outcome is yet another failure on the U.S. Department of Justice. I, and I echo the same thing that, you know, we saw the video, the proof was in the body camera footage. Um, but I think that, that, you know, adds on to the lack of trust that's in within within the community. And uh, the question is, what else has this department been hiding? Uh, I think there should be a review of every DUI that this officer has conducted. And I, I think there should be a federal investigation into the Tale Tallahassee uh, Police Department. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Oh, no, Donald Trump only gives a damn about rich people. Uh, but listen to this racist comment. Uh, that he actually makes. And, and remember, he, he did the exact same thing uh, when uh, he, when he was uh, at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And, and I keep trying to explain to people, Donald Trump has one desire. He wants white immigrants in this country. He does not want any people of color. Watch this. Great honor that you're here. It's going to be a very spectacular evening, and people are just wanting change. The rich people want it, poor people want it, everybody wants change. Our country is really doing poorly. We're a laughing stock all over the world, and we're going to get that change very quickly. And this has been some uh, incredible evening before it even starts, because people, they wanted to contribute to a cause of making America great again, and that's what's happened. We're going to make America great again. Everyone knows it. The election's going to be in now a little more than six months, and it's going to be the most important, I believe, election we've ever had. I think it's going to go down as the most important date in the history of our country. That's November 5th will be the most important date in the history of our country. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Did you talk to Garcia's family, President Trump? Well, you said now, that was uh, part of the, you know, the, the BS uh, comments that he made. Uh, but again, he, he's talked about immigrants before and, and what he desires uh, and how he, where he said, I'm going to find the clip for a second, where he wants people from nice countries uh, like Switzerland and countries along those lines. Uh, that's a tale that, that that's a tale there. Uh, I'm going to see if I can actually find that part right there. Just uh, give me a second. Uh, let's see if I can find it right here. Uh, let's see here. I think maybe do I have it right here. Possibly. Actually, I'm going to find a clip in a second. But he says, uh, Gavin, nice countries, Switzerland, countries along those lines. 
He does not want black people. And if you're, if you're an African immigrant, if you are Latino, I don't know what the hell you're thinking. He don't, he don't want y'all in this country. No, absolutely not. And I know we're going to talk about Haiti a little bit later tonight, but he had those famous comments where he referred to, you know, countries like Haiti as shithole countries. Donald Trump made it explicitly and abundantly clear. Look, I'm a proud son of immigrants. My parents immigrated here from the beautiful country of Jamaica. I don't even know if he would want people coming in from Jamaica these days. Um, so when we hear Donald Trump make these comments, when we hear him talking about how he believes that immigrants are poisoning the blood, He's not talking about people coming in from Europe. We know that's a fact. He's talking about people from those shithole countries, as he's termed them. And he wants our immigration system. He wants our whole country to look a very certain kind of way. And we best believe that if we let him anywhere near the Oval Office again, he's going to put in place the policies. He's going to put in place the procedures. He's going to work through Congress to enact the laws that will fundamentally reshape and redesign our immigration system and our country in his image. Um, so this is the New York Times reported um, this, Tyler. Uh, and during the fundraiser, this is what he said. He, uh, he appeared to refer to an episode in his presidency when he drew significant criticism after an Oval Office meeting with federal lawmakers about immigration during which he described Haiti and some nations in Africa as shithole countries compared to places with places like Norway. And when I said, you know, why can't we allow people to come in from nice countries? I'm trying to be nice, uh, Trump said at the dinner, to chuckle from the crowd. Nice countries, you know, like Denmark, Switzerland. Do we have any people coming in from Denmark? How about Switzerland? How about Norway? He continued. And, you know, they took that as a very terrible comment, but I felt it was fine. He went on to say that there were people coming from Yemen where they're blowing each other up all over the place. He's, he's literally saying, dang, can we not get more white people here? Literally, I think this is no surprise to the agenda. Uh, we talk about white supremacy and suppression of black and brown folks in this country. And I think even as I hear his his slogan, this make America great again, I don't understand the peak in America's America where it had this such greatness. But if if we were to say that we have reached this progression of greatness, it was the fact that it was African slaves that were drug here by force that make America great. It is the folks who crossed the Rio Grande who make America great. It is the Native Americans that are that have have been in this country who make America great. It is the immigrants who come from these countries from across the world who build the fabrics of what this nation is. And if we are to be a nation that that talks about our diversity, that talks about uh, the the the, the melting pot that we are in the, and in that uh, it, is, it is those immigrants who, who, who cross who cross those rivers and, and, and comes and come over who build the fabric of our nation and, and, it's, and it's sad and sickening and not surprising uh, that the former president um, continues to, to echo those words out of his mouth. Uh, Derek, if you're black and brown, what he's saying is, frankly, I don't want y'all in the country. So I'm sorry, if you're black and brown, you got to be an idiot to even consider voting for Donald Trump. You know, Roland, we don't even have to imagine what he would do if he got back into the Oval Office, right? I mean, how he attacked uh, Baltimore, how he attacked uh, Atlanta, uh, predominantly black metropolitan areas. Uh, this man uh, said out of his own mouth uh, his true feelings, his true thoughts. And so what we have to do this time around, and I appreciate uh, your show in particular, because we're calling them out. We can't let folks off the hook and just simply try to downplay what he says when the camera is rolling. No, he didn't really mean that. It's a Freudian slip, et cetera, et cetera. No, he means what he said. And just like what he did, well, he attempted to do with the Central Park Five that, that are now exonerated five, the same thing that he did when he was the landlord of an apartment, putting a little C by every application uh, where it was, you know, families of color. Uh, this man has a long history, Roland, of racism, bigotry and hatred. And we have to call it out. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. 
you're 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 not saying destroy, get rid of, and obliterate DEI programs. But when you say DEI disruptor, what do you mean? What I mean is <coughs> that you need to change it. It does need improvement, as any programs do. That's nothing new when you roll out something. Um, so I don't want to destroy it, as it seems as if Charlemagne is suggesting that we do, and that most of it's garbage. We disrupt it. We make it better. Right. Um, I, I think that the unfortunate the unfortunate part about what Charlemagne the God did is that he acts like DEI just came about. DEI has been around forever. IBM had its first affinity group for black people back in 1968. Roosevelt passed bills to ensure that we could integrate the military for World War Two. After after. After a Philip Randolph threatened a march Absolutely. of 250,000 black people to come to D.C. At, correct. Um, the Equal Pay Act is 1963. That is DEI. So DEI did not come about when George Floyd was brutally murdered. DEI has been around forever and we have made great progress and strides in DEI. The reason why Charlemagne probably is able to be on TV and have a voice is because of DEI, because there was a time that he would not have existed. He would not be able to have a voice. He would not be respected. So while we are not where we should be, right, and we have a lot of work to do, DEI has done, has been a fantastic tool to get make, to make progress. So you no, know, it's not about getting rid of it. It is about changing it. And, and also what scares me is that what he did on his platform, he has a powerful platform, and I absolutely respect um, that he has this power, is that he gave voice to all of these um, right-wing Republican ex extremists who want nothing but to destroy DEI. They've proven that by passing laws in you know, half the states right now. I mean, they just had 60 employees let go in, I think it was Florida. Um, well, no, no, no. no. The, the, the 60 were the University of Texas. You also University had it in Florida Texas. because they banned, they banned DEI, Florida, banned DEI. Alabama, Texas, and multiple states. But to your point about destroying the programs, go to my iPad, Henry. Uh, so he's a perfect example. Stephen Miller's white nationalist group is representing this white Hollywood writer uh, who is suing uh, the studio because he's claiming Brian Bineker is suing CBS and Paramount for discrimination because he's saying, oh, I didn't get hired uh, as a, a showrunner uh, because of diversity. Well, well here's the deal. The, 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 the writing rooms in Hollywood are so white, bro, you probably didn't get a job because some other white person reminded me of Mary Fisher's lawsuit against the University of Texas. But what they do, they will, because their end game is to get rid of all of these programs that were created in Hollywood to create opportunities for black and other writers. By, and so this lawsuit operates as the Trojan horse. That's their end game. That's absolutely their end game. And that and that's why I am disappointed that Charlemagne gave them a platform and showed all the things that they were saying as like, like as if if there's a pilot who happens to be black, that that means a pilot is, is deficient in his skills. I mean, the pilot went through the exact same programs and training that every other pilot went. They're not just going and finding a, someone off the street and saying, can you fly this, fly this plane? DEI was created, and I say this over and over again, to help to fix the, a problem in this country where we would not uh, permit Black people, people with disabilities, women in positions whatsoever. That is why it came to be. Look, 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 look right here's his lawsuit, Randy. Look right here. The Bineker mm -hmm. lawsuit asserts that, quote, an illegal policy of race and sex balancing promoted the hiring of unnamed, quote, less qualified applicants, including women, minorities, or LGBTQ writers. Well, first of all, if you're talking about women, you're talking about white women, okay? And if you're talking about LGBTQ, we're not in that category. Because anytime they, when they break out categories, they put the black people in the black category. You can't be in multiple categories. But again, yeah. that's what the goal is. So I think, and again, and listen, listen, I, I, I was texting Charlemagne today. I think, absolutely, I, I believe that the segment should have focused on the white racist attacks on DEI and what their end game is, and absolutely saying, hey, corporate America, don't play performative politics when it comes to DEI. 
have real DEI that can actually create lasting change and have the fortitude to stand up for your own programs? All of that. I mean, what I do, the reason why I changed my whole platform and became the DEI disruptor, I've, I have, as of yesterday, actually, my company turned 23 years old. We have run this company making change in, in, in corporations and in the government to ensure that they were places that were diverse, equitable, and inclusive. So first of all, it's not new. Um, secondly, the reason why I think it needs change is that some people, he's correct, and that some people looked at it as a as something for public relations. Yep. It's very obvious when they do it. It's very obvious. We're not stupid people, but there are companies who are doing well and who have shown in their numbers that they are hiring and oh, promoting. Oh, man, because you, you started highlighting people. Who would you say, I, name, the, name a few companies that you, that you know, you've been doing research, that are doing a great job that others should be following in and emulating? Number one, I would say Ben & Jerry's. Ben & Jerry's, forget it, their entire company is built on ensuring that everybody has a voice and everybody is respected. It's not a policy. It's not a brunch for Martin Luther King. It is not, um, you know, just a training class. So when he stated the statistic about, you know, does DEI programs make companies better? If it's just a training class, of course, it's not going to just make it better. It has to be woven throughout the foundation through of an of a organization that everything they think about involves, are we including everybody? Mm -hmm. Because this is the thing, and this is what upsets me. All of us in this world are biased, right? Everybody. Everybody, everybody has a bias. In this world. Listen, you should, listen. You, you, can, you can criticize Texas, but my ass from Texas, and my parents are from Texas, right. and guess what? I'm going to defend where I'm from. Now, I'm going to criticize it, but I'm also defended. Well, That's a natural inherent bias. But also, like I tell people, if you introduce me to a sister that went to an HBCU, don't let her be an AKA, I am biased toward her, towards her. So what it said is that if you looked at every, every organization from the government to every corporation, all you saw were white males. So they said, we can't just say, hi guys, um, how, you know, you rich white men, could you do us a favor and maybe consider that there's some qualified candidates that are women, that are minorities, that are black, that are gay? No, because they aren't gonna do it. We have to say, we're gonna put some things in place to help you fight, to help challenge your biases. Yep. Right? That's all DEI is when they talk about hiring. It is not to hire unqualified people. It's to hire very qualified people. Well, but here's the deal, though. The, the word, but the word, but you know, Randy, the word qualified is never used when discussing white people. They only, never. they only use the qualified qualified when it's talking about black people, other people of color. My pet, my. If you look at what they're doing at colleges with nepotism, you know, where there is a legacy, you know, the, the, like a, a very good number of people get into these colleges and universities because they have a, a legacy. They have Hell, you ain't got to go to college. If you actually want to be a coach in the NFL, the best way to get one is to have your daddy be a coach. They, <laughs> they essentially hire their sons. Pam has got some questions. Uh, I'm going to go to Michael first. Michael, go. All right, Randy, uh, it, this is a fantastic uh, conversation here. Um, I guess what I would um, ask is how do we push forward the enhanced, more effective um, D, uh, DEI programs at the <clears throat> corporate level? And the, re the reason why I say that is because um, there's you, you have the attack on DEI right now. But also for a lot of African Americans, I would say, a, a lot of us may not be clear exactly on what DEI is. Okay, so how will, how would will we go about? Maybe give us some tips on how we go about pushing forward uh, effective programs with what we have now. We don't have more people like you know Roland was saying that we that, that we need uh, right now. But what we have now, how can we push forward? I would, let me tell you something. I don't ever try to change people's hearts, but people do think and vote and conduct themselves with their dollars. If we say, so a company like Tesla, 
And Elon Musk has made it, made it very clear that he's not pro-black, not pro-diversity, not pro de right. right? Stop buying his products. Damn like, Skippy. Stop buying a Tesla. Damn right. And let me tell you something. If if we would take companies and we said, you know what, this person, this this company has no minorities on the on the board of directors. They have no black people in an executive on their executive team. So we are not going to support them. They will not get our money. And you know how much spending money we have, power we have. They yeah, will all of a sudden. Trillion. They will mm-hmm. all of a sudden become all about DEI. Uh, Where's that girl, Randy? We want to hire her. Money talks and bullshit walk. There you go. Right? Stop allowing people to just, <clears throat> just to take your money and you have not shown any allegiance to them. Like, you know, when they say back, you know, during the civil rights movement, don't don't shop where you can't be hired. Don't right. stop where you can't be hired. It's it's still the same principle. Uh, and, and also, just so folks understand and keep in mind, when you are sitting here watching, you're looking at all of these uh, people on Fox News complaining about DEI. Guess who has a DEI initiative? Fox. News. Uh, <laughs> Kelly, go. Kelly, go. Sure. So I don't necessarily have a question so much as just a thought that I'd like for you to expound upon being the hypocrisy of what Charlemagne said as a whole, considering that he very likely got on The Daily Show because of some DEI initiative. The fact that he has a breakfast club show because of a DEI initiative, the fact that he sat on panels because of DEI initiatives, he's spoken about DEI initiatives in corporate spaces and how he's benefited from DEI initiatives. I am just tired of giving people platforms in which they have absolutely no concept of what is actually going on and or in Charlemagne's case, willful cognitive dissonance regarding these issues just so that he can have sound bites that he can profit off of. Well, here, here's what I think, Randy. And again, my, my deal is, and that's why I walked through it, a lot of what Charlemagne said is correct. Performative, running of the ads, not taking it seriously. But again, where I disagree is saying we don't need it in corporate America. The reality is that's where the money at. That's where the job's at. And what we know, and what we know is corporate America that they can they can actually drive change. Let's be real clear, corporate America. How why did why did a lot of places integrate in the South? Because they saw that train coming and they were like, hey, we ain't trying to have them shut down our department stores. Damn it, integrate, integrate. You said it. Money talks. Money and, with, talk- and let's remind people when corporate America pull a money out of North Carolina. With that transgender bathroom bill, they changed that damn law. When the when the brothers in Mississippi said, "I ain't we ain't playing at Mississippi State under that damn Confederate flag," they changed the damn law and took it down. We as black folk, to your point, got to use our money leverage. And most of the DI initiatives that came forward after George Floyd's death, because them white kids. And them companies were acting a fool. And Adidas, give you an example, Randy, Adidas announced we're going to do a $10 million initiative. Them white folks at Adidas lost their mind. The next day, the CEO announced, okay, hold up. We're going to do $100 million, and in a third of our jobs, we're people of color. They, the whole backlash to DEI is because white people in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd rose up to the attacks on books, the tax on CRT, the tax on DEI are all because they are, they freaked out when they saw them white kids have a changed view. And that's why you now see them now, let's attack woke, let's attack DEI and attach it to everything and make it negative. Randy, go. They are attacking everything that moves us forward, which is not something new. And, you know, when I when I look at Charlemagne and what he said today, you know, one I don't know if he's like technically worked in a corporation. Um, or, or yeah, yeah. The the, the the Breakfast Club is the Breakfast Club is owned by iHeartRadio. Right, but I'm talking about him going to like an office and working. I mean, he's no iHeartRadio. Right. I've right. been to the studio. That ain't right. black. That's not black owned. Right. And, 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 and so what, what unfortunately happens is exactly what happened to him, in my opinion, is what happens to a lot of DEI leads at companies. 
including myself, right? Your message only gets put up if it's approved by your bosses. You have to say something. So what he did today, to me, in my opinion, was to say DEI was not effective, should be thrown away. And that serves the purposes of the right wing Republicans. Versus saying, here's, versus you saying, versus, versus saying, versus what you're saying, Brandy, versus saying, here's the problem with, D, with DEI, here's how it needs to be changed to be effective. Absolutely. Okay. So if, you, if, if, if if there are there are a lot of you know IBM has been effective. Target and Walmart. If you look at what they have done the last several years, they have done some impressive work. A lot of the tech companies they haven't done much at all. But there are companies because the, they understand yep. that if they don't promote diversity, inclusion, and equity, they can't make it. Look at Netflix. Netflix was the first. I mean, they really came out with so much diversity in their programming in the people they had. I I mean, I am telling you, they have done a they, they've done a brilliant job. Right. I mean, outside of this um, good time show that's about to come out, <laughs> they've done a good job. So when they did that, companies like Fox, that's why they have Tubi. They realize that to compete in this world. So yep. while they have Charlemagne and people discounting it, they know they need it. Right? Well, 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 here's the deal. Before I go to Matt, can we go to my iPad? This literally right here is a letter to the shareholders from the CEO of iHeart radio talking about and what do they say the purpose of our esg report is to increase transparency about our esg efforts including diversity equity and inclusion so the reality is here um, but what they'll have to do though is even when they say we've hired a black person they have to allow charlemagne or whoever black person they they promote to speak truthfully well, 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 well first of all he was speaking on comedy central which is which is owned by uh, Paramount. That was that was our heart radio. So funny. Well, but again, no, it, it's it's so. Here's my whole deal. They're different platforms, and what has to happen is this is where you've got to have also real conversations. This is where you've got to have folk with expertise who are bringing knowledge to sort of unpack this. Again, where he was correct, and I agree with, and I've publicly criticized it. Where DEI fails is when it's performative, when they run ads, when they post up on social media, and they don't follow up with action. That's why I've been, that's why I've been criticizing companies and their ad agencies. Don't sit and tell me you're committed to black-owned businesses, but then your ad agencies want to return our phone calls. That ain't real. Matt. So, Randy, I appreciate you breaking this down or adding to Roland's breakdown, but here's my question for you. So many of the metrics that we use for the efficacy of DEI programs, we talk about the C-suite, but the reality is that's not representative of most people who yep. would be benefited by DEI programs. So my question to you is what examples have you seen of good policies, effective policies for your average person, your average viewer who's watching this who would be greatly benefited if they went and applied for a job and knew they had a fairer chance of getting that job. We're not talking about the C-suite because that's a very small percentage right. of people. So what have you seen that applies to, to more of us than that? Well, you know, this is where I believe that, uh, you know, again, where th the studies that were uh, cited got it wrong. There have been great improvements when it comes to black people getting jobs at almost across the board. I mean, from the from the federal government to localized governments to corporations, Fortune 500 and down, where you are seeing more black people get jobs and management jobs. You are right that the C-suite is kind of where we get stopped oftentimes. But to say that we have not made great strides is ridiculous. If I were to name companies, there's so many. Like I just said, Target, Walmart has done a great uh, the tech companies to me have done the worst. If you're looking at um, the promises they've made, the, the tech companies like Facebook and Google, they, they, nothing has moved on their on their scale of, of anything. But most companies uh, across the board have more diversity than they've seen in the past. And the reason why is because they were pressured to do so. People aren't going to do things just because they're nice. And DEI wasn't developed to get unqualified people in positions. It was just to, to, to put, put the net further. Tell me where you are looking for qualified candidates. Um, also, let's talk about your bias, biases, because what's very insulting about what these uh, commentators are saying and how they're attacking DEI is what they're saying is if you hire a black person, that automatically means that you're hiring a less qualified person. Yep. So for somebody to say that aloud, 
is vote. Well, right? but again, no, but that, but that's the agenda. That is the absolute agenda to say that if I see a black pilot, automatically I'm assuming that they're not qualified. So it, 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 talking about pilots, if you look at the airlines, all of the airlines ha now have programs to partner with HBCUs. That but they that's racism. Before. So that's just racist, just being but, but, very clear with their racist language and they're allowed to get away with it. Well, well. The re reverse racism, if you know. No, 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 no. I'm saying, but I'm not, I'm not calling it reverse racism. I'm saying, using that language, if you say I see a black pilot, I automatically think they're not qualified. Racist. You racist. One thousand percent racist. That is, there is no way is around yep. it that racist. Okay. Um, but the cosmetics companies. You look at people like Rihanna who had to come out and and with her Fenty company and say. You, there's no shades that match black people. You yep. got like five five shades. Yep. I mean, there are there are major changes being made every day. Does it mean that there are a lot of companies that is performative? No, of course they're being performative. But I'm gonna tell you something. If black people become active and call these companies out, yep. I promise you that they will not be performative anymore. Let their stocks uh, drop. Let their earnings drop. Yep. Let black people say, we're not buying from them anymore, just as people have done with Starbucks recently. I promise you all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, we all be getting calls like, man. And, and I'll <laughs> add to that for black people, don't fall for the okie doke if they go hire a black celebrity to do some commercials and think all is good. No, the notion Please. is you got to go deeper and broader. I'm going to close it out with this here. This is the quote that Mark Cuban said. Look, the University of Texas fired 60 people who were in DEI jobs. Here's the deal. The university president, he didn't have to fire them. He could have shifted them to other areas. Where Cuban is correct, that these programs are being targeted, go to my iPad. This is correct. You don't have to have a DEI program to practice DEI. You just have to run your business the right way and set standards for how people are treated. Here's the fact, Randy, and this is the last comment. If these companies were doing right by us, you wouldn't need DEI programs because you would be saying to your people, no, cast a wider net. The programs are a way to force folks to have to broaden the talent pool, have to recruit different places. And so to all the haters, if y'all don't want DEI, cool. Give folk an equal shot. But most of you white races, especially all y'all on Fox News, y'all know the game, and you know it ain't an equal shot. Randy Bright, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million, and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. One of the greatest running backs to ever play in college football as well as the pros. He was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the first NFL running back uh, to rush for more than 2,000 yards in a season, won the Heisman Trophy. O.J. Simpson had that smile. He was in movies. He was in commercials. He was the it guy until he went on trial in the early 90s for killing his ex-wife, Nicole Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. He was acquitted in 1994 of the brutal slayings. And ever since then, the name O.J. Simpson has been said uh, with cursing, with shame, with shocking uh, statements. He died at the age of 76. His family announced that he succumbed to cancer. They posted this message on social media. On April 10th, our father, Orenthal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren during this time of transition. His family asks that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace, the Simpson family. He was nicknamed the Juice. As I said, broke numerous records, uh, but it was that case many call the uh, murder trial of the century uh, that changed America's view of O.J. Simpson. Uh, many folks remember uh, the, the police car, the police, the slow police chasing that white Ford Bronco during the NBA finals that had the nation uh, riveted. Some 95 million Americans uh, watched that 
a uh, two hour, 60 mile low speed chase uh, through Los Angeles. He stood trial for the murders of Ron Goldman and Nicole Simpson in October 1995 when he was acquitted. Twelve years later, O.J. Simpson was arrested after leading a, men, a group of men into a Las Vegas hotel casino to steal at gunpoint what he said was his own sports memorabilia. He was charged with several felony counts, including kidnapping and armed robbery. The following year, he was found guilty and sentenced up to 33 years in prison. He was pro on October 1st, 2017. O.J. then uh, moved to Florida, where he often played golf every day, uh, posting videos, things of that nature uh, on social media, commenting on all sorts of stories. Mark Watts was a CNN correspondent uh, at CNN covering that trial. He joins us right now. Uh, Mark, you also played football at the University uh, of Washington. And so your perspective here uh, is not just from a uh, media standpoint covering the trial, but also as uh, a wide receiver playing uh, for, for the Huskies. And uh, I mean, O.J. Simpson was a USC Pac-10 god when he played there. Uh, and he was still seen that way in the NFL. Yeah, and I also worked for the National Football League at one time as well. Condolences to the Simpson family. Arnell, Sidney, Justin, and Jason lost their father today. And whenever I talk about the Simpson case, I also want to acknowledge that two people also tragically lost their lives, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. Uh, what was the question again regarding the question? Yeah. Um, Sad day for all of us. Well, uh, in terms, I mean, he was a. I mean, I mean, he he was a. He was a. You know, pr prior to. I mean, prior to obviously uh, the trial. I mean, O.J. Simpson was a god at USC uh, yeah. in the Pac-10. One of the most revered athletes uh, in college and pro football history. Uh, but all of that, all of that changed when he was charged with these two murders. Absolutely. Yep. Anybody who played high school football in the 80s and in the early 90s and played running back, we all wanted to wear 32 because the juice or Jim Brown. That's how far back his legacy goes. But yes, as you said, Roland, unfortunately, uh, he, did not, um, he did not live a great life past 1995. It took a toll on him. He uh, came down with uh, prostate cancer and he succumbed to it this morning in Las Vegas. Um, when you think about, um, I mean, the ramifications, uh, uh, and the blowback even today, when you look at, uh, a number of people who've actually offered their condolences on social media, uh, they have been immediately attacked. Uh, mm -hmm. and so even in death, OJ Simpson, uh, still, uh, create, uh, you know, engenders a lot of strong feelings, uh, from people. Right. He cultivated a lot of en enemies along the way. And uh, I sat through all 16 months of that case. There were four principal reasons why uh, the prosecution failed to win uh, conviction in that case. It was the DNA evidence. It was sloppy evidence gathering. Mark Furman was portrayed by the defense team as a racist rogue cop who could have possibly planted the right-handed glove at O.J.'s Rockingham address. And then there was a botched glove demonstration as well. Uh, that took place June, June 15th, 1995, where O.J., although the fact that he was sort of a B-league actor, he convinced the jury on that day that the glove, the left-handed glove, did not fit. He couldn't pull it over the palm of his hand entirely. So, yeah, when the verdict finally came out, uh, October 3rd, 1995, uh, it was largely split and the verdict was a polarizing event in the United States of America. 60 to 70 percent of whites felt that O.J. Simpson was guilty. Uh, 60 to 70 percent, even a larger percent of African Americans in Los Angeles felt O.J. Simpson was not guilty. Was it a revenge verdict, if you will? for uh, what happened in the Rodney King not guilty verdicts of the officers who beat Rodney King. And there was also a case that was known as the Soon Jadu murder case. She shot Latasha Harlins, a teenager who uh, was accused of stealing um, less than a $2 
contain two dollar container of uh, orange juice. So at that time in the early '90s, row uh, Los Angeles was a powder keg. It was an explosive community, and uh, I've got this on on pretty good source because I did exit interviews with most of the jury members following the trial. So what I said about what led to the not guilty verdict, you can you 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 can bank on that. I got that from their mouths, how they interpreted the trial. Um, when you, from a media standpoint, when you look at even how his death is being covered, uh, there are some people who are upset uh, that folks even talk about uh, the O.J. Simpson pre uh, pre the, the the pre murder O.J. Simpson. But the reality is, if you're looking at the life of somebody, you cannot overlook the fact uh, that O.J. Simpson was uh, a darling among Madison Avenue. Not only was he a highly successful uh, college football player and pro football player, winner of the Heisman Trophy, uh, again, become the first to break the 2,000-yard barrier in the NFL. Uh, but, man, when he retired, I mean, he was in commercials. He was on Monday Night Football. He was in movies. I mean, he was uh, the guy America loved. That's also the reality of O.J. Simpson's life and legacy. Right. He had built himself so high up there, Roland. And you know, because you're a journalist and you've covered major trials before, our society loves the fall from grace. He was everything that you just said. He was also this. Not even Jim Brown could accomplish this. O.J. was the first black American athlete in the United States, first African-American athlete to receive major sponsorship and endorsement from large cap and major corporations in the United States. Before LeBron, before Magic, before, before anybody, there was OJ. So we have to give OJ his props, as you said, for the doors that he broke open, for the barriers that he ran through, it's unfortunate, however, that he is known for something infamously what uh, sort of brought me onto your show tonight. Isn't it also, it, 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 I think it's also um, interesting that when we look at this, I mean, look, he was acquitted in 1995. Um, you're talking about next year, 30th anniversary this trial everything around uh this case still is riveting today uh i i, I a person who is a who's gen z today may not fully understand how shook how divided this country was uh when it came to uh the arrest uh, the trial, everything, the trial, everything around it. I mean, it was, it absolutely captured everything in America. Yeah, it, it was all that. Um, I remember it was pretty much the only story that I covered for 16 months uh, <laughs> from June 94 all the way to October 95. It was the only story that I was assigned to as a CNN correspondent based in Los Angeles. Um, it was also this. It was America's first unscripted reality show. This was before there was such a household term as reality television. O.J. Simpson was the first, the trial was the first unscripted reality show that the world had ever seen. And I'll never forget it on verdict day I was wrapping up an interview with um, constitutional law professor Alan Dershowitz. And someone came up behind me and said, hey, Watts, this is a reality show. And Professor Dershowitz and I looked back like this and, and we said, reality show? What, what's he talking about? And uh, I excused Professor Dershowitz because he had to get upstairs uh, because the verdict was about ready to be read. But yeah, uh, it was all that. Um, so many people were fighting to get on the jury panel. It uh, was a reality show. 
and such a highly publicized court case it generated astronomical ratings for CNN um, it led to so many spin-offs people who names you'll know Greta Van Susteren uh, Dan Abrams Cynthia McFadden it was the just so many spin-offs where people got their own television shows attorney Johnny Cochran also had a show there were so many things that sprouted from this because it was so huge everybody was was fixed on watching what was coming out of this trial um, just because OJ transcended so many cultural spectrums in the United States as you said there was Hollywood there was NFL it was Monday Night Football he was a sideline announcer uh, sports Hollywood media um, good-looking guy great-looking ex-wife him being accused of murdering her um, and just everything else that was rolling along with the city of Los Angeles at that time it was just the place where major news broke and I don't know how I got stuck in all of it but I was there for all of it I had a front row seat pretty much to history as it tilted on its axis no, Roland, I do remember how I got there. <laughs> oh, man, you didn't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Come on now. Uh, Come now, on now. Now, look at that. I've aged like fine wine. I, st I think I gave you those glasses, didn't I? <laughs> that was pretty much had, had, had to go into the crates. <laughs> yeah. That was uh, June 13th. Uh, I was outside OJ's house at 425 Rockingham. That was in Brentwood, uh, well-to-do western suburb of Los Angeles. And, yeah, I was positioned outside his house for about 12 to 15 hours all the way until the Bronco chase on June 17th. Your beloved uh, Houston Rockets were playing the New York Knicks. I remember that well. Uh, I was on Larry King's show running around crazy chasing O.J. in a white Bronco, driven by Al Cowlings, hoping that he didn't commit suicide. Um, there's just so many iconic, um, wild days uh, that I remember covering that case. Uh, and it's just something that uh, just will never go away. The reason, Roland, it sticks yep. with people today is because the truth has never been told. The real truth has never been told. All these pundits and all these reporters such as myself will go on TV uh, today, tonight, and tomorrow and give their opinions. But the real truth has never been told. And I believe there is one single objective factual truth. And that's what I've been chasing for 30 years. Um, you know, as people get older and, and, and they want to get things off your chest, off their chests, Things just sort of arrive in your inbox, um, note, notes and, and recollections and things that people said. Uh, I believe I'm close, really, seriously. I'm being serious now. I believe I'm very close to the real truth. Um, and when I get it, I'm going to come to you because you're my favorite journalist, of course, and we're going to talk about it um, because that's what people want to know. Even the 67% of African Americans across the country who felt that O.J. Simpson was not guilty, there's a shred of doubt, like, hmm, what happened? What happened to the murder weapon? Why was there not more blood inside the Bronco? What happened to the bloody clothing? How could a guy supposedly kill two people that fast, get packed to his house, um, get in a limousine, go to LAX. But here's one fact I'll leave you with. I don't know how much time we have. Um, something has never sat with me, and it, it hasn't sat with me for 30 years. Um, O.J. Simpson was strip searched down to his underwear on June 13th, one day supposedly after he allegedly killed his ex-wife and Ron Goldman. It was a bloody crime scene, Roland. I saw it with my own two eyes. 
It was a bloody mess. There was some serious altercations that took place. Um, but what I can't figure out is if O.J. Simpson supposedly carried out those two murders and Ron Goldman had defense wounds on his hands and he had slash wounds on his sneakers. When they examined O.J. Simpson on June 13th, the very next day, remember, he did not have a single cut, abrasion, or bruise, except a small cut on this finger on his left hand. Now, Roland, you and I have scrap. We've been in some scraps before. I'm going to get a few in. You get a few in. You might win the fight. I might win the fight. But we're going to walk away from a fight bruised. We're going to have a cut. We might have signs of trauma. He had none of that on June 13th. And that's what's puzzled mm. me for 30 years. And that's what's pushed me as a journalist. Although I do have an opinion of what happened, I want to find the truth. I want to find that one single truth, that incontestable factual truth, so I can tell the world what really happened. Mark Watts, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Going to my panel for perspective. Uh, Reese, you first. That was a riveting interview, Roland. Um, I have to say, for me, I grew up in Los Angeles. So I lived through Latarsha Harlan. I lived through Rodney King, Reginald Denny as well, and the OJ trial. And so I want to speak up for Black people during that time. I know a lot of people um, have opinions about his guilt or innocence particularly from a 2024 lens, but I want to say that while there might have been some Black people who looked at it as a get back, I believe as a person who grew up in LA, who followed the trial as a Los Angeles resident, that a majority, I would dare say, and Mark uh, just gave the statistics about the number of Black people who thought he was innocent or not guilty, we felt that way because of the evidence that was presented at trial. And so I just want to be clear that this whole notion that Black people were bloodthirsty, unhinged, irrational, just trying to get a lick back, I don't believe that's really accurate, not for a majority of Black people. I think that Black people largely... And as he said, even a larger number of people and Black people in Los Angeles thought that he was not guilty. We followed the evidence. And so people are, are entitled to their opinions. I think reasonable uh, people can have different conclusions, different convictions about this case. Obviously, it's tragic that two lives were lost. But I just want to, for me, bat down the idea that Black people are just unhinged, irrational, just loyal to OJ strictly because he's Black, as opposed to the fact that this was a trial that captivated our area for 16 months. It was followed very closely. And look, if the glove don't fit, you must quit. At the end of the day, the prosecution didn't do their job. Johnny Cochran and OJ's team did their job. We'll never know, I guess, what happened. He didn't go down confessing to anything. And, you know, we don't know. But I just don't like the narrative. And I think it's very easy in 2024 to be on your high horse about your convictions, about whether he's guilty or even if you feel like he's not guilty. But back then, I'm glad that you provided that historical context about how the environment we were in and the way that the actual case was presented at the time and how we drew our conclusions. Lauren. Um, I think what the, sh the case always represented was it was really the first time ever in a major, major court case in a major way that a black person sort of got away with murder, quite frankly. <laughs> and that never happens. That was probably the first time in American history that it, that it ever happened. And the reason he got away was because he had the resources to represent himself with some of the best attorneys in the country. Barry Sheck at the time, who would later uh, found the Innocence Project, was the foremost attorney on forensics. He had F. Lee Bailey, he had Alan Dershowitz, and of course he had the great J Johnny Cochran. 
And that's unheard of for a black defendant any time, any place. Uh, it, it upset the natural order of what our history has been in the United States. Uh, people get away with murder all the time. We still sit here not knowing how Natalie Wood died. Uh, we still sit here with the story of Byron de la Beckwith, uh, who sat around, you know, walking around for years, uh, no justice served. Uh, obviously, Carol, uh, Carolyn Bryant. Uh, people get away with all sorts of things, but he was the first black guy that got away with it. And I think it was quite noted by everybody at the time, but I don't know that they really articulated it in that way at the time. And that documentary, uh, OJ uh, Made in America, really goes into a lot of the sort of dynamics that are really not talked about in any nuance when it comes to OJ Simpson. Uh, but it was a it was a terrible thing, though, that two people were murdered. Uh, and it, it's not something that we should just, you know, shrug off. But I think we do have to understand the perspective. Uh, we have always had to deal with, as African Americans, the lack of justice. Uh, when uh, Lyndon Johnson told the FBI to go find uh, Shorna Goodman and Cheney, they went down there and found, found the bodies of, of other people who had disappeared in the South because they'd been lynch lynched and nobody cared. So we, I think as black folks, have known that history forever. I think white folks don't know that history. And when OJ got away with it, it was a huge thing uh, because of that primary reason that wasn't supposed to happen. And it happened right. because he had the money. And it happened because, quite frankly, his attorneys were way better than Marsha Clark and and what was the other dude's name? Uh, uh, it was Christopher Marcia Darden. Uh, Chris Darden. Thank you. And Chris Darden. Chris and, Darden. And they they couldn't keep up. Chris Darden and Marsha Clark could not keep up. So anyway, Got that's it. my take on it. Great car. Absolutely. Yeah, they couldn't keep up. Uh, uh, soft racism. Today is a day where we see that nothing has changed in America. This is not a, a nation. Uh, white folk mad as hell on social media. Black folk are largely silent or making jokes. But remember what Jackie Robinson said at Jackie, uh, I mean, um, what uh, Jesse Jackson said at Jackie Robinson's funeral. He said, Jackie has passed away and now he has stolen away home where referees are not allowed. Ironically, uh, Jackie Robinson, another great tailback, except he played across town at UCLA, a generation before OJ. But today, the juice is loose. Meaning what? You can't get him. That white woman and that white man were killed, and somebody got to pay. As as you say, Lauren, he had better lawyers. Chris Darden, up to that time, had 18 straight, I think, uh, convictions uh, on his side with the prosecutor's office. But Johnny Crockett had never been beaten by the uh, by the LAPD and by the LA prosecutors, and he wasn't beaten that day. Uh, I showed uh, my students uh, the footage because that famous footage. And by the way, Monique Presley said on social media today, she was one of those Howard Law students that was in that famous scene in the split screen where all the law students are embracing and cheering at the verdict. And my students, these Gen Zers, as you're talking about, Roland, they sat there riveted and felt the same things we felt in 1994 and 1995. We, in other words, this wasn't about guilt or innocence. And, and one correction, black people didn't feel that he was not guilty. He was not guilty. He said something called beyond a reasonable doubt. And you're right, Reese. I mean, Mark Furman, a stone cold racist. Look, Johnny Cochran's team put on a brilliant, put on a clinic in how to prosecute. They didn't call all the witnesses they wanted to. It was like Ali and Zaire in 74. They didn't throw all the punches they needed. They had, they had. They just let this thing kind of tease out. The evidence, the chain of custody, everything was put into play. And ultimately that verdict came back not guilty. But what happened? You wait until OJ busts in a room because you got some of his old trophies and his mama's photo album and got a gun and some boys with him and you get him for kidnapping and you get him for assault and he goes to jail. Why? Somebody got to pay. And then you hound him over and over again. This isn't about OJ, guilt or innocence. This is about a country in which race is at the foundation of its identity. OJ Simpson is the reason we know some damn Kardashians. Remember, Robert Kardashian was on that team. Everything from the Kardashians to TMZ, the guy who founded TMZ was one of the people uh, who got caught up in that media circus. Jeffrey Tubin with the New Yorker and CNN till he messed up and now he's back again. Why? Because if you're white, you can have second and third and fourth chances. But OJ didn't have second and third chances. Finally, this is, I think, perhaps the most interesting thing of all today for me. One of my uh, young brothers came over to the law school uh, Wednesday night, my class last night, and he had on a T-shirt 
with uh, looks like one of his homeboys, his partners. And I said, is, who is that man? He says, my man, he was killed in Chicago. I said, did they, did they find who killed him? He said, they don't solve murders in my city. Here's the bottom line. White life in this country is the only life that's valuable to a lot of people. O.J. Simpson represented everybody who has been punished for losses of white life, whether he wanted to or not. The famous, I'm not black, I'm O.J., was said when Cochran was saying this is about race, this is about black. And O.J. Simpson responded to Johnny Cochran and said, yeah, black, black, I get that, but I ain't black, I'm O.J., meaning what? Dude, I'm the one that's going away if you don't save me. It didn't mean, regardless of O.J.'s opinions, that he was not a proxy for race. And what we are faced today with is the fact that the responses to the death of O.J. Simpson show us not only haven't we come very far, we haven't come far at all. Mm, that's true. Indeed. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. 2022, a black man was strip searched in broad daylight in Jacksonville. Well, the results of that is that the sheriff's office has said that those officers uh, were wrong and violated a policy. Ronnie Reed was stripped in the middle of a street in front of his family members. The officers did not find anything, but he was arrested for selling cocaine. The state attorney's office, the state state's attorney's office dropped the charges against Reed in February, but only after spending more than a year pressing him to accept a plea agreement that would have sent him to prison for at least four years. Nicole Manna of the Tributary, the investigative reporter who broke the case, joins me now from Jacksonville. Glad to have you uh, on the show, Nicole. Uh, hey. first, so now the sheriff's department goes, yeah, they really didn't follow the rules uh, in uh, how he was uh, pulled over and strip searched. Right. So the sheriff's office actually opened their investigation into this arrest after our reporting on on what had happened, our reporting that questioned if they broke policy, if they broke state law. Um, that investigation was opened in March of last year, and it was closed in September. And we only learned about it by filing another records request um, asking for that investigation. Um, they had never notified us that it was closed, um, despite the fact that our reporting is because of our reporting is why it was opened. So now I'm confused. Okay, so the rest takes place in February. They opened the investigation after the fact. What was he initially stopped for? So the arrest actually took place in September of 2022. We didn't publish our first story okay. until March of 23. Um, so that is when the investigation was open. Um, what happened in that arrest is um, the police were doing a um, kind of drug operation. Um, an undercover officer gave $20 to a different man, um, and that man was seen walking toward Ronnie Reed. He went. That man went back to the officer, gave him um, whatever amount of cocaine, and then those officers approached Ronnie um, and searched him down patted him down, didn't find any drugs, didn't even find the $20 that police had given the original man. And then that is when the strip search occurred. Wow. Uh, so they never actually saw Reed give this guy drugs. So therefore they assumed he was the drug dealer. Right. That's how it seems. The original arrest, arrest report um, on Ronnie isn't exactly clear of what happened other than this other man walked toward him. Um, in the investigative file from the internal investigation, um, we had we saw an extra line that says an officer witnessed a drug exchange. But again, there were no drugs found on Ronnie either at the time of the arrest or at the jail. The $20 that was given to the other man in exchange for cocaine was found in his hand when he was arrested. It was that money was never found on on Ronnie Reed either. And his defense attorney told me that she brought that to the state attorney's office and said, I've never seen a drug dealer give on credit. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, again, another one of those crazy stories of what cops say one thing and something else, uh, you know, actually happens. But but what was nuts here, they were trying to get this man to plead guilty. 
Right. They spent more than a year trying to persuade him to plead guilty and take a four year prison um, sentence. But he kept fighting. He went through multiple defense attorneys and ultimately the case was dropped um, in November. I believe it was November 14th or 5th or I'm sorry, February. Um, I believe it was February 14th or 15th. Um, and that is when the state attorney um, said that they did not have enough evidence to bring him to court and prosecute him. Uh, questions from the panel. Uh, Robert, you first. So with, uh, with this, will there be any sort of uh, uh, apology, restitution, anything paid to this man for what he's had to go through in this situation? Uh, because I've had similar cases to this. This is not an isolated incident. Uh, what systemic changes is the police department going to make to stop this from happening in the future? So one of the interesting things that came out in the internal investigation is that the officers who stripped Ronnie said that they were actually never trained on what the search policy is, and they didn't even know that what they did constituted a strip search. So, of course, we asked JSO, knowing this information, have you done additional training in the in the department? We never got an answer back on that. Um, JSO told um, one of the local TV stations here that they do offer and do require training on searches. Um, but again, we, we don't know if there's anything that they're doing beyond um, what training they say they already have. And I do know Ronnie is talking with the civil attorney. Scott? Yeah, Scott Bolton here. He needs to talk to a civil attorney about this. You know, the, the idea that the police believed that they could strip search someone in public because they didn't have proper training. I had good home training. I had good upbringing. <laughs> taking somebody's pants down or making them strip in public just seems to be just at your core. We shouldn't do that. We should take him to the station or we should put him in the police van or something. You just your core should tell you that, whether you're a police officer or not. But, but here's another question similar to Roberts, right? What about training and what about reformation of the prosecutor's office? I'm a former prosecutor from New York City. Either you got the evidence or you don't. Theoretically, philosophically rather, ethically, under most state bar rules and the ABA, if you can't prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, if you, if you can't prove the case or you don't bring the case, then you don't sit there for a year and try to get them to plead or something. Because that means they're not trying to do justice, they're trying to get a conviction, right? Any discussions with any groups or that uh, state's attorney's office about that reformation piece or that ethical piece, because the Ronnie ought to bring uh, ethical charges against the assistant state's attorney for how they've handled this case. Because if they were gonna dismiss it anyway, what were the internal memorandums about whether they could prove the case or not? And, and was there a memo that said, oh, just get him to take a plea, as opposed to dismissing him and doing justice? Roland, that's the difference between doing justice and just going after a conviction. Go right ahead, man. I think that is something that he's exploring with his civil a civil attorney. Um, we actually haven't heard too much from the state attorney's office on that, on why they decided to continue to pursue these charges. Um, when we first wrote the story, um, the answer was essentially um, a crime was committed and we are moving forward um, with this case. Yeah. We haven't heard much of an apology or any other details of, of why this was dropped um, or what the internal communication looked like. Um, but that is information that we are looking to get, hopefully, through future yeah. records. I, I, I'd make that part of your investigative reporting because that gets mm -hmm. lost sometimes. But that's a huge issue because the police are one problem, but the prosecutors drive the investigation, drive the prosecution, and they've got to be ethically based. And if they violate their ethics, they ought to be brought to accountability. Yeah, there are definitely right, two parts of the story, just like well, you said, JSO and the state attorney's yeah. office. Um, so, yeah, yeah we're going to continue reporting on this and seeing what we could find out. And Roland, one of the uh, one of the first cases uh, I did with Henry yeah. Daniels back in the day uh, was a case similar to this where a man had half an aspirin on the stove and they tried to uh, charge him with possession of crack cocaine with intent to distribute. Uh, and it took us over a year uh, to get that case dismissed against him once they finally got lab results to show there was half an aspirin. Uh, so this is not an isolated incident. Just thank God we have mm -hmm. a journal that you can actually deal with issues like this. Yeah. 
Abs- absolutely crazy. Nicole, great job reporting. Uh, keep it up. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. In Illinois, a former mayor will investigate the allegations of misused public funds of a sitting mayor. Dalton trustees hired former Chicago mayor Lori Lightfoot as a special investigator to investigate the allegations against Dalton Mayor Tiffany Henyard. Lightfoot will lead an independent investigation into corruption claims, reckless spending, and retaliation. Someone who's made good governance, the cornerstone of my public service career, I recognize maintaining the trust of those you serve and making decisions in their best interest is absolutely essential. The residents of Dalton deserve nothing less than a government that is fully accountable, responsive, transparent, and effective stewards of your precious tax dollars. of a charity that um, uh, from the attorney general's office is. Henyer became the first woman mayor in Dalton's 103-year history in 2021. Roland interviewed Henyer in February about the numerous allegations leveled against her. When we talk about these particular situations, where we're talking about corruption, or they're talking about people not dotting I's or, or, or crossing T's every single day, we're seeing to have these investigations and Mayor Lightfoot is is in in the spotlight again, looking at this particular situation. Uh, Dr. Walker, when you're looking at a situation like this, how do you envision this going? How do you envision, you know, is this gonna be a situation where people are gonna talk about, oh, you shouldn't be trying to take a sister down. Uh, We should be, you know, looking out for each other. Is that what Chicago politics is about? How do you see this playing out? So I I would say first, I'm not sure if Lightfoot is the best (laughs) best person to come in and, and consider she was one term and all the issues she had during, during her tenure as mayor. There's that. Um, secondly, listen, you know, you know, we get these conversations in the black community about, you know, how, or who can hold, hold individuals accountable. And so I was coincidentally, uh, when Roland had uh, mayor Henyard on, I, I was on that night and had a chance to, ask her a few questions. And Roland took a lot of time to really unpack a lot of the allegations. Some of her responses were, were, were interesting. And, and I would, I would say not, not complete. So uh, maybe, you know, former mayor Lightfoot will get to the bottom of, of some of these challenges, some of these issues, accusations, but, uh, and some of them, like, like I said, are, are troubling in terms of mismanagement, bullying, et cetera. And she, and like I said, Roland had her on and she, she, you know, she offered a, a bit of a counter to some of those allegations. Uh, but, you know, once again, this is, you know, regardless of, you, of your black, white, et cetera, you, you, you have to be transparent. You have to be a strong leader that people have faith in. You highlighted her being the first black woman ever elected, you know, to this office. In fact, she held she two offices that she said when she was on Roland uh, several weeks ago. But once again, you know, public trust and in, in, in the well-being of uh, your fellow man is something that, you know, you take an oath as a as a public servant. And so uh, I'll be interested to see if what happens when this final report comes out. But like I said, uh, choosing Mayor Lightfoot is, is a choice, I guess. And doc, <laughs> Dr. Ali, when you look at this, especially when we talk about the election and, and across the country, when people are, there seems to always be a, a stronger eye that's put on black politicians. And to be quite honest, even when we take it outside of politics, people want to relate anything that a black person may do that's wrong. And in many instances, even right, some type of DEI conversation. I can even hear those types of rumblings coming out as it relates to this is what <laughs> happens when you have black mayors. I mean, what do you think about the overall spectacle um, of this investigation? Investigation as we look at this particular issue, not only in this particular context as it relates to, to Dalton, but in the larger context of how black politicians are viewed in general. Yeah, well, I always tell people don't play with me because I can give you a laundry list of white politicians over the years, mayors, county commissioners, and others uh, who have not, uh, not have not utilized the public's trust or resources in a positive way. Um, So we got to always be prepared to make sure that we uh, tell the fullness of the story. Now, with that being said, 
you have a responsibility uh, to actually use public funds uh, in the ways that the citizens that you are representing are asking for. You have a responsibility for transparency. You have a, a responsibility uh, for accountability um, as well. So, you know, someone taking a look at if that has happened um, is it, just good governance. Um, and we should make sure that that is always taking place, no matter whom is the individual who is running a city or a parish or whatever the situation might be. But we also have to call out the fact that there is always a brighter spotlight. When I worked on Capitol Hill, uh, I saw uh, white congressmen uh, who got themselves into trouble. And then, uh, unfortunately, I saw one of our own who did. And I saw that the media just kept circling like buzzards around the, around the person who represented our folks. Um, so we've got to also be very mindful that there is still this disparity in, in how stories are covered and whom uh, the spotlight is placed on. Uh, but that also means that, as our parents always told us, that we had to be twice as good. So that means if we hold elected office, uh, we have to be twice as good. But we also have to be twice as good in making sure that if someone is coming for our folks and they're doing it in an illegitimate way, that we have places like this network to make sure that we are sharing the truth uh, in an unbiased way, but in a way that helps to educate folks uh, on what the situation might be and also highlighting folks who are doing the work correctly because we have a number of black politicians on from all levels, from local all the way up uh, to the highest levels in our government uh, who are actually doing the job the right way and they should be getting applause, they should be getting flowers. Um, and if we don't do that, then we are not making sure that folks are honoring the excellence that exists inside of our communities. No, I, I hear you. And, and Dr. Malvo, how, what type of advice do you have for how do you feel Mayor Mayor Henry should handle this? Do you feel like getting out in front of it, doing the media interviews is, is the best way to go? Is it about being low key and let the investigation play itself out? We see so many times throughout history that sometimes when people are under investigation, and I'm not saying this is the case of her, but if they know that they are doing something that's shady and nefarious, they try to come out with a little bit more bluster, try to get in front of the cameras more. And and try to just think that they can kind of talk these particular situations down. Given the history of situations like that, do you think it's better for her to kind of stay low key, cooperate with everything, or get out in front and just own it in front of everybody and, and let the pieces fall where they may? You know, I'm a Congo, from what I'm reading, I don't know that this is stuff she really wants to own. There's a sexual assault thing in there. There, and, and From what I'm reading, and of course, I really don't know. Um, I got invited to come on today uh, a couple hours ago. So uh, I was going to call my Chicago people and say, what's up, y'all? Uh, what's going on? I do think that the appointment of uh, Mayor Lightfoot is fascinating. You know, as Dr. Walker says, fascinating because it basically almost removes at some level the notion that this is racist. So you've got a black woman investigating a black woman. Uh, is there bias involved? And many would say, so they got cover now. Mm -hmm. Whatever uh, Lightfoot comes out with, there's cover. Uh, I hope that some of the things I've read are not true. Uh, but if they are, the system might just want to resign, frankly. If they, if, if they are true, as, as Dr. Walker said earlier, he was on the panel when uh, she was interviewed by Roland, and her answers were not um, completely transparent. They have to be completely transparent at this point. Mustafa has also made a really excellent point about the eye that's on black people and especially on black women. Um, I'm thinking back to the way that uh, Dr. Gay was treated and as the president of Harvard uh, with the man who, uh, who basically went after her, his wife was a, a plagiarist who actually used Wikipedia in her dissertation. Mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. laugh right now. Wikipedia, I mean, come on, can't you at least think of something else? They got footnotes in Wikipedia. <laughs> you use the Wikipedia footnote, not the Wikipedia, but they didn't need here nor there. That was, a, but black women are always under uh, enormous scrutiny. Um, and so in fairness to, uh, you know, Sister Mayor of, of Dalton, she has been under a microscope since she won the election. And the other piece of it is these are her former colleagues. She was on the, um, what was a supervisor? She was, she was on the board with the folks who basically are bringing the action. So we have to ask what kind of personal BS is going on? What else is going on? Um, but I, I would advise her to get a good attorney 
and, and a good publicist. Because it would not be for me to say, should she get in front of it, she get behind it. But she needs somebody to uh, manage the story in a way that is at least harmful to her. If there is truth to these allegations, cop to them. But if there's not, defend yourself, defend yourself, defend yourself. But understand that the context in which this is happening is a highly racialized context. Um, we, we've seen it you know, with black women. I t- mentioned Dr. Gay. I could mention the, the, the little baby girl, um, Angel Reese, who a mm. sick white man described as a, what do you call it? A, a, Dirty debutante. Uh, yeah. And if you Google that, guess what comes up? Mm. Pornography. See, I had never heard of a whatever de- debutante before. So I said, hmm, I know I'm old. I know I'm behind the times. Let me Google this and see what they mean. And the first thing that comes up is somebody's naked behind. Mm. Um, so basically, you know, but, but black women, we get slammed. We get slammed. And so she has, what, whatever else is going on, everybody who watches the story have to, has to acknowledge the racialized environment in which it happens. And as Mustafa has said, he's absolutely right. We can't do the stuff that white folks do. You know, white folks get away with so much it's not even funny. And yes, yeah, that's, that's racialized. But you, I remember when... Um, Diggs, but Diggs had to resign from Congress, and it was over something like using his cr- congressional credit card to to basically buy some furniture, and he said he was gonna pay it back, and he probably was, but somebody blew. It was less than thirty thousand dollars, if I remember. Cause this is a long time ago, but it was less than thirty thousand dollars. Meanwhile, you see these other folks doing all kind of foolishness, getting away with it, and no one blows a whistle on them. So understand the environment. And this is an unfortunate story. And I think it's going to be unfortunate for both the both mayors in terms of uh, Lightfoot's not going to relish, quote, taking a sister down, if that's what she's going to do. She's not going to relish that. I mean, I think she's a fair person. Um, didn't love her as a mayor, but I think she's a fair person. And she she's probably one of the best to investigate. But this becomes a black on black thing. And our people are going to take sides. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits.